Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining in. Uh, we're just going to be waiting a few more minutes for uh, further attendees to log in, and uh, we will start the webinar shortly. Thank you. Okay, just two more minutes and we will then start. Again, thank you so much for your patience. Hi. <clears throat> Hello. Hi, Venkat. Yeah, I just made you co-host. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks. Okay. Do you want to start? Yes. Is the host there already? She had, she had some question about Facebook. She wanted that link. Okay. I don't know whether she can see it or whether the link. Just give me a second. I'll just find the link and I will paste it in the chat window. Okay, cool.
We'll be starting in a minute, folks. So patience of your time, uh, appreciate your patience. Okay. Joji, if you're listening in, I have put in the uh, link in the chat window so you can access it from there. Uh, Venkat, I'm also going to send it to you on WhatsApp just in case. Sure. Thanks. Oh, okay. I got it. Great. Okay, guys. So welcome to the webinar. Uh, this is Venkat from Coastal Impact. Uh, we will start off now. So uh, let's move on to the next slide. Sit. Hello. Sorry, Venka. Just give me one second. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is a webinar where we are expecting a few people. So please follow the guidelines, which is a listen and view only mode. Only the panelists and the hosts will be able to uh, enable your video or your uh, talk mode and uh, we request you to put all your comments in the chat window you can find that by moving your mouse either to the bottom of the screen or to the top of the screen uh, but your questions please put only in the q and a window they will not be answered otherwise and also all the questions will be answered only at the end of the presentation because we don't want the presentation to be disturbed by questions in between. Trust you understand that. If you do have a question and you find that somebody has already posted that question, then all you need to do is just click on the thumbs up and that will kind of upgrade that question. So you don't have to actually ask the same question again. And that will take, that'll get priority, it'll get moved up, okay? A little bit of information about Coastal Impact. We are an NGO which was established in 2009 and our main charter is Marine Education, Conservation and Environment, oh, sorry, and Research. And we also own a re recreational scuba diving company in the name of <coughs> Barracuda Diving. So uh, we are running a micro fragmentation uh, transplantation uh, project right now, which is transplanting of coral and uh, because of course the of the monsoon and covid we have stopped for the moment but hopefully we'll restart that in october uh, we are also looking at doing an edna uh, project waiting for the funding at the moment so our upcoming webinars uh, we have got on the 12th which is the next saturday we have got aranyak which is doing a conservation project for the wild hog and uh, it's a talk by Parag, who has been involved in this for more than three decades. So uh, it's going to be interesting. Uh, this is a part of the uh, Habitats Trust uh, finalists, uh, which we are running, which is a conservation tale. So we're going to be inviting several of their uh, of the people who are doing excellent work in conservation all over India. And we're doing that bi-weekly. So after 12th, then the, not the next uh, Saturday, but the following Saturday will be again another presenter. On the 19th, we have got a fantastic presentation by Shashank Srinivasan, who, who runs a company called Technology for Conservation. And it involves drones and underwater drones and all kinds of technology, which he's doing for uh, 3D modeling, even underwater, for studying uh, conservation and uh, helping with that. So you will find a link to all the completed webinars on you, which are posted on YouTube. The links will be posted at our website on WhatsApp, Facebook, and as on Instagram. So please go there. If you missed any of those, you can have a look and uh, catch up on that at leisure. So now we're talking about SSI, which is given us this platform to present this. There are several ecological based courses which are uh, hosted by with uh, by the use of online courses by SSI and these are not just for divers these are also for non-divers so by all means please uh, register yourself and have a look at the uh, information that is there it's a lot of information over there 
uh, which I'm sure you'll find very, very useful, whether you're a diver or a non-diver. And if you want to do all of them, then you can actually get a package deal from SSI. And it's very cheap considering the value that you're getting. So please do jump in and do that. If you are a diver and you want to follow up with dives and uh, questions and a Q&A session, then we can also fix it up so that you can uh, learn even more, okay? So the only prerequisite is that you have to be a minimum of 10 years of age and that's really it. So coming to our presenter for today, we have Joji who is currently working for uh, NIO and uh, she has spent four years, let, hang on a minute, let me, I've lost her CV here, just give me one minute. EDNA is a very new field, a relatively new field in uh, research and it's a completely non-invasive and amazing way of studying uh, whether you want to study uh, biodiversity or whether you want to study particular uh, subjects. It's an amazing way of getting it. So she's in the biological oceanographic division of NIO. She has spent four years in the micro microbial ecology and marine molecular ecology with four peer reviewed published papers in international journals. Her PhD studies involves the diversity of halo-tolerant halo uh, bacteria in the salt pan of South India and their molecular basis of tolerance and biotechnological potential through metagenomic and whole genomic analysis. I'm sure you understood all that. I didn't have a clue. She's currently working on metabarcoding eDNA single cell sequencing of deep water, deep sea water sediments, mod nodules and specimens. I'm sure Joji will be better able to shed light on what she does and all that concoctions that she cooks up in the lab. So let's move on to the next slide. Oh, that comes right at the end. Thank you. Okay. So we will, I will hand over to Joji now. Joji, you're on. So please yes. do your presentation and enlighten us. Thank you. audible hello yes i can hear you yeah hello ah uh, am i audible yes yeah yeah and my uh, i i already shared my screen is it clear yeah we can see it okay then i can start please uh, good evening all uh, myself i am joji john actually now i am working with dr dinesh ram uh, biological Oceanography Division of NAO Donapola Goa. So today I'm going to uh, share a bit of information on eDNA, like magic of eDNA for tracking marine life. Uh, I know some some of you will be the experts in this field and some of you will be the common people. So uh, these slides are prepared only for common people. So there is no scientific terms are introduced and there is no complex scientific terms are explained. It's like a basic uh, presentation. So we are going to start magic of eDNA for tracking marine life. So uh, first of all, I'm going to give an, a bit of introduction why we need to do eDNA or why what is the use of eDNA? So we have to start with biodiversity. So I know you all will be familiar with the term. We share this planet with millions of other species, but how, how do we know which species are out there and how we can track of them? Actually, uh, nowadays scientists predict that around almost approximately 1 million species are at the verge of extinction. So how we know which species are, are at the verge of extinction and what are they uh, at an ecosystem or uh, specific location. So we need to know and we need to track them. So here comes like why it is important. So we need to understand which species are present in different places 
and role they play in their ecosystem. So with this knowledge only, we can figure out how to protect important organisms and their habitats. So biodiversity is the totality of all inherited variation in the life forms of Earth, of which we are one species. We study and save it to our great benefit. We ignore and degrade it to our great peril. Actually, this is a famous quote. And uh, in a simple, simple, simple words, the variety of life on Earth and all its levels from genes to ecosystem and can encompass the evolutionary, ecological, cultural process that sustain life, that is biodiversity. So biodiversity studies can be helpful in uh, detecting ancient ecosystems. So to understand plant pollinator interactions, then we can know the understand the diet of these uh, particular species present in that ecosystem. Also, we can study invasive species, then pollution response and air quality monitoring. Then we need to conserve our species diversity in all over and everywhere. For like, uh, there are rare ecosystems are there, then uh, connectivity, protect land, lands. So we, we should protect the animals being from extinct. For that, we should first know what all animals are there. So first of all, till uh, the advent of this the next generation sequencing and molecular sequence uh, techniques, we were following traditional monitoring of the animals in that ecosystem, like uh, physical identification of the species by visual surveys and counting of individual in the fields using distinct morphological characteristics. So morphological identification is heavily dependent on taxonomic expertise, which is often lacking or in rapid decline. Sometimes traditional monitoring relied on highly destructive techniques invasive on the species or ecosystem under study. All such limitations of traditional biodiversity monitoring have created demand for an alternative approach. So recent advancement in DNA sequence technology created a breakthrough in the field and bioinformatic data analysis and its reduced cost has increased genome-based identification. DNA basically contains the blueprint of every living organism determining how each organism looks and functions. So the, here it comes, I'm introducing the term genome, gene plus chromosome. The term genome is made up of the words gene and chromosome. It refers to all of the genetic information that the genes within the chromosome can carry. So uh, we can find, we will be able to read all the genetic information of an organism from its DNA. So the analysis cost per person were decreased from, uh, the graph shows from 2002 to 2020. Actually, uh, we were using like, uh, now we can even get a whole human genome with $1,000 and the metagenome, everything is, cost is reduced. So I will explain later what is metagenome and what is metabarcoding. So here comes our advanced tool, eDNA, a powerful tool for biodiversity monitoring. So what is eDNA? Actually, E stands for environmental DNA. So the DNA which comes from the environment is known as eDNA. That is substance found in the environment, such as water, soil, saliva or poop can contain DNA from the species living there. See, uh, I think you all will be hearing, so, uh, watching so many movies like uh, foreign, using forensic. From one blood dot, we can find DNA. So the DNA is intact there. So we can be retrieve the DNA later. Same thing is happening here. From the environment, we can found the DNA uh, from the material like water, soil or poop of the species who were lived there. So we can find DNA floating in the water from our rivers, from the organism that lives in them. Then uh, we can collect water and analyze the environmental DNA from it. Then we will be able to know what all species were there and um, who were living there. Over the last 30 years, scientists have started using DNA barcodes to investigate which species are found in different environments. This DNA barcode term just stands for this uh, DNA, like we, we won't be analyzing the whole DNA, whole DNA, we will be analyzing a part of the DNA. 
once dna is left in the environment its preservation and thus availability varies with several orders of magnitude from weeks to temperate water to hundreds of thousand years in cold dry and from frost see that is uh, the dna will be remained in the environment but it will be there and it that depends on several factors like temperature is the major fa factor then microbial enzyme is the another factor and uh, when we are taking the samples for dna extraction also there are lot of challenges so next we are going to see in depth what is edna so edna is like potential for nuclear dna or rna but most we are frequently use mitochondrial dna why we are using mitochondrial dna mitochondrial dna is more stable in the environment and in each cell there are many copies of my, uh, mitochondrial dna so that will be easy, easy to amplify Mitro, then mitochondrial genome is short so sequences are known for most organism you may be heard about coven primer that is also a, a mitochondrial marker which is used world widely for taxonomic analysis most of the organism have its sequence deposited in databases several databases MT, mitochondrial DNA is relatively easy to amplify because it appears, I already told, in multiple copies in the cell. Then mitochondrial DNA content is strongly conserved across the animals with very few duplications, no introns, and very short intragenic regions. Like uh, the other genes are like, we can say actin, or some other genes are like, they are uh, undergoing mutations rapidly. But in the case of mitochondria, the mutation rates are very low. So it will be different from species to species. So we can easily identify the species used with this uh, mitochondrial DNA. So then next question comes, why we want to go for eDNA? So the, uh, it is reduced cost and we can find the hidden organism, more species found in community, even we can identify from larval stages and the time is also less. I think now we can even get, if we are getting the sample and we can do end day process in one day and second day we will get the sequences out. Then more sampling, like if we are covering like more area with more water sample or some sediment sample, we can cover more area and time. Then we can uh, see, this is, these pictures are given some examples. Like it can, we can even guess how many creatures there are all just by checking the water. Uh, normally physical monitoring was we will catch and count that will be um, the, the organism will also be, be going and we are destructing the ecosystem. Now with just the water, we can know uh, how many creatures were there in that water. Then by studying environmental DNA, we will be able to stop overfishing in the ocean and adjust our fishing habit by knowing the number of fishes and number of variety of different species of fishes present in there. Th then also we can say some, uh, some of the animals may be extinct, but their DNA will be still there. So we can easily identify that it was exist, that creature exists, and we can believe that endangered spe species in that particular location can also be identified through the DNA. Another uh, other two, uh, important factors are like we can detect rare species and identify invasive species and also we can preserve the ecosystem. Here we are going to see two different aspects of D eDNA that is species specific approach and taxon wide approach. In taxon wide approach next generation sequence is used and it is very most common. Uh, then combination of both can also be uh, used. So eDNA barcoding or species specific approach, that is we are going to detect like targeted specimen. We, can, we are only focusing on one fish or we, we are only focusing on one coral or we are only focusing on one species which is abundant there. So we will be using that species specific primer. That means that primer will be specific to th that species and only that species which is our interest, which is of our interest will only be identified. So here we can use standard PCR or qPCR. Standard PCR is most commonly used to identify. qPCR is just used to quantify 
like uh, how many of that same species there means we will be going for quantitative pcr then uh, we will go for traditional sequencing then identification of that single species we will identify that is species specific approach next we are moving to taxon wide approach so edna meta barcoding or taxon wide approach in an ecosystem we know maybe 100 or thousands or 10000 of species will be living there we have to know what all are present there how uh, all whole community we have to screen then we have we can use several conserved primers then uh, we can go for ngs then identification of all diversity of the location for just in simple case we can i can uh, i'm giving an example if it is in it is a pond and it's how all the all type of eukaryota so we can use like an 18s primer so it will be giving all the organism which is present there we can pick out what all are there and how this ecosystem is formed everything we can understand, uh, just understand from that whole community so i'm just gi giving some published examples for species specific approach as well as taxon wide approach this is a paper by victor ital published in 2019 they used species specific coven primer of uh, coven is a mitochondrial primer for identify larvae of cubera snapper fish collected from the water of uh, ukapto reef at tropical research institute field station and san blas island islands of panama so in this paper what they use they just used a coven primer uh, in that area and and they identified all the larval and juvenile stages of snapper fish that fish is shown the uh, this side up then next moving to taxon specific approach so i think all will be familiar uh, about the aquarium story so there is uh, at okinawa there was a study conducted by mia et al at 2015 so they were collected water from the aquarium like it was distributed in six uh, tanks so they know that there are thing like we all are visiting aquarium so we will know how, how many are there so they know that uh, uh, 180 varieties of fishes are there so then they take taxon specific uh, approach using a 12 fish primer so they just uh, take the 1 liter of water and try to extract all the dna and try to use this primer to identify that 180 uh, varieties of fishes and it was very successful 93.3 percentage was identified that means out of 180 varieties 168 uh, species were fish species were identified so out of the 180 marine fish species uh 168 species which contributed to 93.3 percent is distributed across 59 families and 123 genera were identified using taxon specific approach then we are going to see combination of both aspects actually um, see some of the ecosystem will be very very rare ecosystem so from my experience i was uh, these days i am working with deep sea so there are only few existing sequences are there in uh, deep sea so we won't be able to we needed reference database to get all this information so in here they are used the combination of both aspects like they just uh, directly fished all the uh, individual fishes and identified with species specific primers then they collected water from the same area and they used 12 primers like a species wide primer and then they identified all the fishes which was identified earlier that individual fishes like that group of that individual fishes identified they were used as a reference database for this meta barcoding of edna uh, of water which is collected from the same area so this is little bit advanced thing so if we have some of individual species from the same location we can use that as a reference in a uh, taxon wide approach then uh, see some of them will be uh, e even if like we collected 50 of individual species maybe dna will give sometimes it may give 45 sometimes it may give 60 that means 
some of the individual fishes were there uh, it could be could not be found and some of them were there and edna could not could not be found so this method is like a very advanced method combination of both aspects so next we are just going to see the overview of marine ecos edna in marine edna studies in marine ecosystem so like um, how the pro procedure moves on like we can collect a water 1 liter of 1 liter to 3 liter or 1 liter to 16 liter of water or if we need more we can collect more then we can just filter the water through either through the normal filter paper dish or through cartridge filter paper then we can extract the dna then we can go either for a uh, species specific uh, approach then we will only get one species or we can go for taxon wide approach we will get all the species all the community structure which were, which is present in that 1 liter of uh, water so actually this graph shows the rise of edna research so uh, by 2018 324 papers were published in environmental dna plus edna in ocean uh, marine science, marine ecosystem uh 1672 paper were present in or considering their all ecosystem with edna so if we are just understanding a world in a bottle of water so traces of environmental dna in that bot in a bottle of water and analyzing entire ecosystem from microbes to whales so now just we, i'm going to explain how we are we normally perform edna studies from starting water collection to uh, the analysis so first one is water filtration uh, first one is water collect collection and filtration then filter preservation and storage then ship samples to our lab or, uh, or wherever we are getting a facility to extract the dna then lab dna detection then we are will be amplifying the dna with our gene of interest or our primer then we will be analyze sequencing it then um, bioinformatics analysis i'm not going to in depth uh, pro, uh, pro method of like how we are analyzing all these things i will be giving an outline to everybody can understand so if you have any questions regarding anything in detail i will be showing the mail id at the last slide so you can send uh, send me a mail i will reply so first we are going to see water collection and filtration so in uh, water in we filter of that water sample using membrane filter or otherwise storage of filter paper so for story ammonium chloride is uh, highly like uh, at a uh, one percentage was very effective to retain 92 if we are collecting the water and if we are not able to next 24 hours either we can freeze it and we can transport to the laboratory or we can just add del benzyl alkonium chloride then we can just uh, transport to the laboratory nothing will harm uh, this will not harm the dna so dna will be intact we can then now retrieve the dna so there are lots of challenges in water collection first of all we need to stop edna from leaving the party we need to keep uh, strict uh, measures to keep our edna what we are collected which is present in the collected water to be leave there so these are the factors which affect the edna degradation like light temperature microbes and enzymes and time of hold like holding time how 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 many hours or how many minutes we are holding the entire water sample uh, outside without any precaution without the proper preservation so the first of all we need to make dna free environment and equipments like the major challenge in water collection or any any at any any step of edna the human source mishandling so to avoid human source mishandling we can wear clean non powdered single use gloves when collecting samples and removing filters also we can keep everything clean and in a separate plastic bags which should be discarded and replaced any time of contamination is suspected then we will be collecting water uh, from like um, if entering into the water site, sampling site 
we can use rubber boots should be the and it will between sides like in the, in a river in a pond we will be cutting like will be one in and we'll be going from 10 meters apart to collect the second sample so that between the uh, side the, we should avoid the contamination if sampling is stream collect sample upstream of your standing location to reduce potential contamination boots clothing or equipment so uh, then here maybe somebody will have a doubt why uh, this human source will affect our dna see in at this stay, uh, at sequencing time we will be like uh, tear, uh, we, uh, at a step we will be cutting the dna into pieces and then only we will be going for bead um, bead attachment and sequencing so if human dna is there means the major pro proportion of human dna will be cut into pieces and after cutting into pieces like 1 150 base pairs or 200 base pairs it will be detected as like uh, it won't be human detected as human dna some of the genes or some will be there so it will be very difficult to avoid human dna contamination at this uh, stage of analysis so first of all we have to take care we should make sure that nothing is coming from our hands or our rain so now let's moving to water and filter paper the first question arises when edna comes into mind how much volume of water required for the filtration so the volume required for filtration is generally based on the concentration of target species of edna in the water sample for an example like a um, few month before we started with the meta barcoding of coral samples coral water, um, surrounding water were collected and we were using some primers to amplify it so at that time 1 liter water was collected and it was not uh, giving any dna there were very faint band of dna like 2 nanogram per mul only we got so that means we need to uh, the 1 liter was not enough because maybe due to that we collected the water from surrounding and the dna dispersion rate may be stored there or that concentration of target species was very low in that water sample filtration volume in the actually from previous literature vary from 1 liter to 6 liter and higher less than 1 liter is not recommended filtration of large water volume is often difficult due to sediment and other biological particulates like clogging of individual filters many edna studies use uh, now we are going to move to filter paper size like so many different sizes are there so many edna studies uses pore size ranging from 0.45 micrometer to 3 micrometer like uh, in marine um, ecosystem for water filtration we generally use 0.45 micrometer commonly used filters include glass fiber cellulose nitrate polycarbonate nylon polyether sulfonate and cellulose acetate filter papers so now we are going to move how to store is our specimen without uh, edna so water if it is not possible to filter at the site bring to the laboratory in ice chest and filter within 24 hours or frozen before processing if we are freezing the water at minus 20 or minus 80 only one time we can thaw that means when we are ready to filter that time we should filter all the water storing water sample in fill, uh, freezers so next moving to cartridge filters if we are using cartridge filter we can be logged with plastic tips or stoppers uh, with adding extraction buffer of choice or ethanol or we can freeze it directly at minus 20 degree so uh, i generally prefer either we can add extraction buffer of choice or my, uh, we can freeze minus 20 degree why i am not preferring ethanol ethanol will like um, squeeze the filter paper so it will be difficult when we are if we are um, say, um, trying to extract the dna after a long time so when we are moving the filter paper disc from the filtration apparatus we should put gloves and we should use a forceps which is already decontaminated or sterilized so this graph shows performance of edna sample storage methods after 7 days here atl buffer stands for extraction buffer and ethanol then uh, storing at 4 degree celsius ambient temperature silica beads here ethanol is showing a high performance uh, even the uh, dna edna samples after 7 days then extraction buffer is also good 
but we are uh, if we are freezing at minus 20 degrees celsius that will also be great filter paper disc can be transferred aseptically into a new clean vial then we can fill with extraction buffer of choice till the filter paper completely immerse in it or we can directly freeze at minus 20 degrees celsius see why we are um, recommending directly freezing at minus 20 degrees celsius maybe at the time we will be choosing some method we can use this extraction buffer but later we may be thinking to change the method then that time we won't face any problem if we are freezing directly at minus 20. now moving to uh, dna extraction this is just a simple outline of how the dna is extracted like sample preparation when it is our filter paper filter paper will be cut into uh, different pieces then we will be going for lysis then we will be add protein sk to remove the protein and we uh, sometimes we will treat it with rna say then dna will be bind to silic using silica columns then washing then eluting the dna now our dna is uh, re-resolving in either in te buffer or in nucleus reward so there is also challenges uh, the DNA extraction won't be successful if the salt concentration is more than like in the case of clogged filters. The filter paper is, if it is clogged with more sediment or uh, more algae, our DNA extraction won't be like successful. Then nature of the sampling site. For example, if the sample is, uh, site is contaminated with high metal uh, concentration, so this metal will be uh, in, um, the metal will interact with the DNA molecule and so our protocol won't be enough to retrain the DNA. So in, the, in all these cases like metal contaminated site or uh, deep sea uh, sediment, something like that, we will be going for a pre-processing of our sample. Then uh, at volume of water filter, if the volume is too less, DNA won't be detected. Then presence of humic acid substance in the sample. See, if the sampling site, uh, if we, the collected sample is more with fecal contamination, the humic acid or humic sub substance will also be more in that uh, particular sample. Then uh, it will be difficult to extract the DNA. Choice of methods. Uh, we can select our own method and we can use either manual method or several kit methods are available like QRGIN DNA EC kit method power water, power soil, phenolchloroform extraction method. Here is a graph I have extracted from Hino et al. 2017. Uh, they use DNA freeze, D, uh, actually DNA EC method for freeze uh, frozen sample, DNA EC method for ethanol, then precipitation method for uh, frozen sample and uh, power water method for like different method. And the, uh, they got almost uh, similar results for, or like uh, even it, it was in, in, spite, in, in spite of the uh, storage methods. So the critical part of the DNA extraction lies on lysis or homogenization step. If it fails, if the filter paper is not lysed or not homogenized properly, we won't get any DNA. Uh, like it will be failure of, uh, DNA extraction and we won't get any DNA from that. So whenever, whatever methods we are using or we are selecting, if we are using manual methods also, the first thing we need to keep in mind is we should homogenize our filter paper completely. So next we are going to move the yield of DNA. So like uh, previously I uh, already talked, Yield of DNA also directly depends on the volume of water filtered and concentration of target species in eDNA in the water sample. So here in this graph, the dark gray stands represent for 200 ml and light gray stands for almost 3 liters of water. So see, the 3 liters of water gave enough uh, like uh, 80 nanogram of DNA per mule of the uh, sample. So the lower the concentration of target eDNA, we can even isolate the eDNA from uh, like that also but we need to filter more water then uh, why we like actually there is a standard dna concentration needed for the analysis 1 to 10 nanogram in 50 mule is the standard dna template concentration required for a standard pcr with a purity of 1.8 that means a high quality dna with 10 nanogram in 50 mule uh, we need to uh, do a standard pcr 25 nanogram DNA is needed for visualization in agrose gel electrophoresis and 5 nanogram is the detection limit in nanodrop. 
So even if we get any D DNA less than 5 gram, we won't be able to detect less than 25 nanogram, we won't be able to detect in a gross gel electrophoresis. Nanodrop usually gives the sum of DNA fragment, other DNA fragment, degraded DNA, RNA, degraded RNA and nucleotide. Why it is important is sometimes we will be like getting 350 nanogram per mule of DNA per one mule of DNA when we are extracting eDNA. But that doesn't mean that in our sample, 345 nanogram of DNA is there. That means this is the sum of DNA fragments. So we cannot rely on that. That is completely our pure DNA. Now moving to the PCR. I think uh, all will be familiar with the PCR, polymerase chain reaction, like a photostat, just to understand simply. It's a photostat machine. We, we will be keeping a paper and we can take into 100 copies with a photostat machine. Here, instead of paper, we will be using our DNA and then we can take millions, create million copies of DNA using this PCR. Uh, basically, three steps are the denaturation, annealing, elongation. First, the DNA will be tear apart. DNA is double stranded, so tear apart to single. This one, and after the end, it will be uh, again. Uh, it will be again forming together like a double um, stranded DNA, fully DNA. Then again, it will repeat. Normally, generally, we will go for up to thirty-five to forty cycles. So. This many cycles, after this many cycles, we will be getting million copies of our initial DNA. So in PCR also, there are lots of challenges. If any impurities in the DNA, like humic acid or humic substances, or even any metal concentration, and uh, any prote protease or proteins, RNA con contamination, if something is there, means some, uh, the PCR won't work. Then the template DNA concentration, and also selection of primers. And if we are selecting even good primers or uh, even working primers, the annealing temperature matters. So dilution of original D so DNA into 1 by 10, 1 by 20, or 1 by 50, depending on the con initial concentration, will overcome the impurities in the DNA. And it will give a successful piece here. Annealing temperature. How to find the annealing temperature of a primer? So, Normally, we, when we are synthesizing primer, we will get an annealing temperature like forward and reverse scan. So then in just five degree or four degree, we can find the annealing temperature easily. If it is difficult, annealing temperature can be standardized through setting up a gradient PCR with a variety of temperature at initial stage. So primers, how, primers can be selected from already published papers or we can design with respect to the target species of choice using several um, like uh, several softwares are there like primer 3 we can use we can found the genome and we can extract the uh, choice of like area then we can our own design otherwise we can just create a degenerative primers and we can use that so now next i am moving to edna sequencing so there is two aspects already I discussed, uh, species specific and taxon wide. So there is two aspects of sequencing also. First one is next generation sequencing. So here I'm showing it to easily understand, break, break part the DNA, we want to analyze and uncoil the double helix to separate the strands. Then we can bind this separated strands to a beads. Then we can add all the uh, base, bases individually and we can um, just sequence it. So here, four steps are there. Like we, first, we will be preparing a library, then cluster generation, sequencing, and data analysis. I'm not going into deep into this uh, protocol, protocols, these steps. If you want to know more, you can send a mail, or even a, you can read. Like um, there are several papers, and even easy il illustrations are there. Next is sequence. Tanger sequencing, that is targeted sequencing. This is used for species specific uh, identification. So we will like, uh, this is a chain terminating DNTP uh, we are using here. Then here also we will be doing PCR, then sequencing, then we will, uh, we will get a forward and reverse sequence. We will combine the sequence like conduct preparation. Then we will blast it with existing databases 
will identify the individual species uh, based on that database result. So now we are going to see the challenges in uh, EDN. And um, so starting from study design to add the keyboard, like that means till the analysis, there are lots, lots and lots of challenges and lots and lots of precautions we have to take care to get the, the uh, correct result. Like uh, first of all, study design. What is our uh, study goal? Sometimes we want, may want to find whether that fish, the fish was there. So we need to know whether now it is present or absent there. So otherwise we, we may know, we need to know what all the fishes or what all the group of organism is present in the river. So otherwise we need to absolute quantification like this uh, sardine fish was there, is there, or oh, it is there we know, but we don't know how many numbers of sardine fish is there. Then uh, what taxa will you target? Is the scale of inference of your sample type appropriate to your question? Then can you compare complementary data types? Like uh, uh, if we are getting individual, we if we if may have already from previous data, may we may have a species specific data that is traditional method. Then now we are getting eDNA. Whether there is a chance to compare both? Then moving in the field, we need to decide first of all what type of sample is needed and what metadata should you collect. Like maybe with sample, with sample if we water, soil or air, we need to, every time we need to take, measure the physicochemical properties of that same location. Then how many replicates will you collect? In eDNA or in any molecular studies, he, that replicate selection is plays an important role. Normally we will be using in triplicates. That means three samples from same location. So this will uh, minimize the error, which is coming at any step of the analysis. Then does our sampling protocol minimize control for contamination or any known biases like inhibitor, sample volume, contamination, like we can keep to avoid contamination or we can make sure that there is no contamination by keeping a positive and negative control. Then in the laboratory, sample handling phase, we have to start what um, decide, what extraction method, how much sample we need, we need to use, what locus and primers, do you need to generate reference sequence data, then our te technical replicates are needed. That means once uh, same sample, we can run two, three times, that will be technical replicates. So what library preparation method will you use? Everything we need to standardize. Then after uh, reaching at the um, data analysis, then uh, the DNA process, the sequencing, or single end sequencing, then we need to make the quality assurance. Then what library, um, that's our control for contamination or any known biases like that. We need to just use like, which is the rough we should use. There are lots of reference databases. There is 108, 132, there are lot of if the uh, selection of reference database is wrong, the entire result may be vary. So then do you have adequate sequencing coverage for samples? Then are you appropriate choice of software tools, parameters, biological conclusions upheld using alternative parameters and workflows? Then the analysis, but everything, everything starting from study design to the analysis, there are lots of challenges. Then another thing is we will get all the DNA which is present in that one bottle of water, but we cannot say whether that fish is live or dead. Then no species detection without existing DNA database. So if the DNA, um, if the DNA of particular species is not there, means we cannot uh, uh, identify that species. So now just I'm going to share is small bits of my current research which is happening at NIO. Uh, first, we, this is the part of PMN studies, polymetallic nodule, environmental impact assessment. Uh, that means uh, just after mining and before mining, we are just calculating, uh, understanding the biological diversity, so if some mining is good for them or bad for them. So here we have collected sediments and water uh, for the EDN analysis. So this is the, like a small, uh, 
result from sediment like uh, it is the deep sea sediments was collected from almost 6000 meter depth with a multi corer and 0 to 5 cm was used at each station two stations were there irc and prc and the universal 18s meta 7 primer actually that is a 170 base pair product it was used for identifying and we have found like 89 percentage of uh, identified 89 percentage eukaryota in uh, prc and 73 percentage at irc and the diversity spanned with 25 phyla during this metabar coding then moving on to the water we use bongo net for studying community structure of surface uh, zooplankton and isoplankton zooplankton are uh, fish larvae then uh, two different meshes of 200 and 500 micron were attached to two sampling buckets mm, then actually almost 3 lakh of water was filtered um, 3 lakh liters of water was filtered with each sampling from in this uh, pr set we identified 28 percentage of uh, sorry 56 percentage of metasova and uh, 28 percentage in ir set but here in water analysis major of the um, species community were assigned as unassigned because due to the lack of database and 68 percentage was unassigned at ir set and 37 percentage was unassigned at pr set and others were 5.8 percentage at pr set and 3.2 percentage at ir set the further analysis is going on we have found lots of like uh, interesting result some some of the uh, uh, species is only present in particular location which, uh, that is absent in other, other location like that uh, that analysis and in depth analysis is going on so just uh, only out outcome uh, just run over here only i have presented here now the other works we are focusing on are just uh, doing in collaboration with venkit sir uh, like a coral diversity analysis using an 18s primer actually uh, from 1 liter of uh, water, water we have extracted the dna until amplification it is done and we are waiting for it to be to, to be sequenced the uh, sediment from water we are also finding micro meo megafauna then uh, macro also uh, uh, then other thing is we are just also trying to combine both aspects like species specific as well as taxon wide specific from all the sediment data and water data we have um, uh, just extracted the single single organisms and the dna barcodes are created so we will be using that as also a reference database then we will be combining uh, the edna data as well as the meta barcodes of that species specific um, aspect so here i am um, concluding my talk uh, so i think I, i i have not used any technical terms and uh, any in depth thing so if you have any doubt i'm showing um, my email jojijohn@gmail.com or jjjohn@nao.org and din@nao.org uh, he is my boss uh, dinesh uh, ramsar so uh, then i would like to uh, if you have questions you can ask just before that i would like to sorry georgie we lost your volume your audio uh, very uh, afraid to take this then um, uh, to cost the impact venget sir uh, actually thank you very much sir for giving this opportunity and to all organizers sir, and to all participants i don't know to what level you have understand if you get any doubts regarding anything you can just any time you can mail me it may take a few day maybe one or two days to reply but i will give you a reply for sure thank you joji that was very very informative although i must admit i lost a lot of it in the terminology if this is what you have prepared for beginners i hate to think of what you're going to prepare for scientists okay but anyway i guess it is a very technical field and um, so uh, it is difficult to get a handle on it and it's from what i understand it is changing quite a lot right there are new lots of new things coming in the uh, field of edna and it's quite a task they staying abreast with all the new research methods uh, to tell the people here a little bit about it because i have done traditional surveys which are uh, using line transect surveys 
So basically, we used to put a, a tape down on the seafloor <laughs> at different depths. And then we would go along that and uh, look at what is directly under the tape every meter or so and collect the data, whether it was coral, whether it was sponges, whether it was uh, what kind of sediment, all that was recorded. And then coming back along the same transect line, we would look left and right and count the fish biodiversity and the species. So all this was done physically with a uh, underwater paper or with a slate on which we used to mention all this. This is all really old primitive technology and particularly if somebody like me is involved in it, it was very, very subject to errors because I'm not a scientist. I'm not a marine biologist. So then came the age when we would take cameras down and we would record as many photographs as possible and then give it to the scientists so they could have a better idea. Followed by now, uh, of course, the video cameras, GoPro made it very easy. So we would record everything and then give it to the scientists and they would look inside, sit in their uh, labs and analyze frame by frame what was there. But this technology is completely mind blowing because it does not even involve diving. You just have to get water samples from maybe the surface or at depth and then analyze the whole thing sitting in a lab. And uh, the results are getting better and better. Earlier, I believe it was quite primitive, but now it has gotten to a stage where we have next gen sequencing is coming. And uh, as Joji has already mentioned, there's a lot of scope for further improvement uh, along the same lines. The great thing about this is it is completely non-invasive. It just blew me away when I first heard about this, which was two or three years ago from an American marine biologist who was diving with us. And when she mentioned this, my mouth just fell open. I could not believe something like, like this could exist where you could take a one liter to five liter water sample and then you could get all the DNA within the last 48 hours, whatever has been in the water, you could extract that and study it. Of course, there are limitations, which are again being kind of, uh, the system is getting better and better at uh, identification and at, uh, broad spectrum analysis of the diversity, but it's quite amazing technology. That's why I thought we would have a presentation and I think Joji has done a great job of educating us. Joji, at the bottom of your screen, you've got a Q&A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you want, I will read the questions for you, or if you are happier, you can just read it by yourself. And then yeah, uh, I will uh, read it myself, and then okay. I will answer. So go for it. Yeah. The first question, in reverse and auctions, where water is in motion, doesn't the eDNA get widely dispersed? Uh, example, you get a sample of eDNA of fish somewhere in the river, but the fish actually resides further upstream than where the sample was taken. How do you account for this? For what range is the eDNA can accurate indicator that a species is present in the area? I think uh, uh, maybe this uh, question was asked at the um, starting of my presentation. I have explained this during the presentation, but I will answer it again. See, uh, if, if we, uh, that there is a chance that the eDNA get widely dispersed in a moving water. But that where it comes, like uh, we are um, the challenge of selecting the sample location. So if we are selecting three or four samples, sam uh, sampling location from the same area, we will get all the community of uh, fishes which is present in there. Then if we are getting that uh, eDNA and if we are identifying that fish which is from that area, we have to assume that that fish is from that river itself. We cannot, uh, that is accurately, we cannot tell that the um, fish comes from other area. If we want to find the origin of that fish, we can go for like uh, one genetic connectivity studies. Uh, it is um, two in-depth studies in using eDNA, like we are selecting from that three different location, then we can connect it with uh, using the genetic markers, then we can identify that fish is either directly from there or it's migrated from somewhere else, or it is dispersed due, due to the water motion. I think this question answer is clear. Then next question, 
what do you think if we use atns gene to detect marine invertebrate see uh, i will answer from my experience actually first we were targeting coven cytochrome oxidase one and atns primers but for cytochrome oxidase uh, for us it didn't work we used atns primer to uh, detect marine invertebrates like atns metastoven primer for deep sea sediments deep sea water samples as well as deep sea crude samples so i think atns also can be used and there is a, there was one paper which which saying atns give more um, species diversity uh, it, that study was conducted in a marine invertebrate from a, uh, i think from it was from ccc at region or somewhere in pacific but it was giving high uh, number of almost the, it was covered all the diversity then uh, how effective is this the edna technique as i already told there are some disadvantages is also there for edna technique like we cannot differentiate live and dead and if there is no reference database we can some like in my result the major proportion will be going to unassigned but the uh, there are lots of advantages also so i think the edna uh, technique is effective because we are not harming the ecosystem without harming the ecosystem we are getting the community structure of that same ecosystem so i think the edna technique is also effective even though drawbacks are there by day by day it is improving a lot then next question since quaging kits are much easier to use is there any benefit to use trisol or phenyl chloroform isomel method trisol is uh, trisol method is used generally used for um, rna extraction uh, then quaging kits are much easier to use but the problem is uh, if any inhibitors is there or the uh, dna concentration is low that uh, they, the kits having some detection limit so if it is lower than that it won't be detected and phenyl chloroform isomel alcohol method actually i i'm using manual method at every time so i just uh, modified the phenyl chloroform isomel alcohol method so for me if this question is answered from my experience i will be um, suggesting like phenyl like phenyl chloroform isomel alcohol with modifications will work very well when we are comparing to kits actually i compared kit uh, dna yield with kits and also this manual method then i found that for me manual work, work method was working very well Rough, roughly how much edna can be extracted from 1 liter sample before amplification i have already answered it depends on the presence of target species in that water if we are taking water from um, really like uh, the uh, species are really diverse there from 1 liter sample we will get like 4 uh, uh, or 5 nanogram per approximately approximately 4 or 5 nanogram per mule that will be very really enough to us to carry out the uh, all, all analysis can we also estimate the densities of target species i don't have any idea about this uh, if um, you can send a mail uh, i don't know who answered this question if you, i will read and i will get back to you if you send a mail uh, mail this question what percentage of reference data available for marine species uh, so for marine invertebrate i am using silva 108 and 132 it covers almost all the group of um, existing all the group of existing species then also for fishes bold databases there there are several databases then also there is a possibility that we can create our own database by collecting all the uh, sequences from either from ncbi or from bold or from any other uh, databases we can create our own also so i think for for me i am using silva 132 that is advanced one which is recently released it contains almost all the marine invertebrate species and also everything is there eukaryota is there metasova is there and uh, for 16s microbiology is there uh, all the all the taxon is covered in that when a coral reef uh, coral feeding fish migrate to a non coral environment one one we find coral dna as the fish defecate while migrating in non coral waters want this spoil edna objective see when we we are founding a coral feeding uh, fish to migrate to non coral environment so 
See, that is a possible. We will find that uh, maybe coral also. But uh, the thing we know where we are sampling, and also I already told in challenges when we are sampling, we need to make the make sure that physicochemical properties and the appearance of uh, the sampling site. So if it is not a coral site, we will know come to know that it was a migrated, or we can even go for diet analysis. if we are getting any doubt that there is no coral so how we recognize a coral in our result which one coven or atenus uh, to detect multi species marine invertebrate using edna metagenomics both primers can be used both are uh, accu giving accurate result is density gradient centrifugation yes uh, in some steps with some kits there is a density gradient centrifugation is also used to uh, pull down all the uh, dna uh, to uh, at the end of the uh, centrifuge tube was the traditional sanger sequencing method sufficient to differentiate between species dna found in this uh, samples actually i didn't understand this question uh, i i think uh, maybe the, um, the uh, person mean that to found the dna in the samples differentiate between species dna found in the samples actually we are using sanger sequencing for in species specific approach so that means we will be, for an example if we are using a macrain fish we will be only targeting on one specific primer which amplifies macrain uh, that fishes dna from that sam, uh, crude uh, dna so we will only get that um, macrain fish amplified after pcr then that sample only we are going to send for sanger sequencing at the end we will get the dna uh, sequence for that specific uh, fish which element tool is recommended for use to identify species in your samples uh, see actually i am using uh, just meta barcoding analysis for that i use time to as well as puma tools do you use multivariate analysis like ps pca and m n m d s to compare species found in their relation to each other and the yeah i use do you get your sample analyzed at the nao labs or separate independent institution uh, actually basically i am a bioinformatician so i know how to um, analysis that meta barcoding uh, diverse community community diversity samples as well as the individual sequencing and whole genome meta genome so in our uh, lab uh, our lab is bioinformatics lab we have a server with uh, 124 gb ram that is really enough to handle all this data so we are anal we are getting sequence outside and we are bringing back the raw files to our lab and we are analyzing it there what is the false negative rate of analyzing it by ngs uh so false negative rate of analyzing by ngs uh i think that we will get like uh, some thing but that won't be false negative but uh, i have to check this question friends in the amount of cell free dna secreted there is a difference uh, in self species also there is a thing like uh, if maybe the dna even if the dna is similar same amount uh, there are another fa environmental factors which will be affecting the the um, Degrad uh, degradation of the DNA, so we cannot say that it is similar. Atenus gene used detect plankton or marine invertebrate. There are different kinds of atenus genes. Like uh, for if we are want to detect plankton, we can use atenus genes which is uh, coming in that plankton community. If we want to use for marine invertebrate, we 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 can choose atenus gene from marine invertebrate. i i have used both atenus gene for detecting plankton diversity as well as marine invertebrate diversity there must be a library of dna sequencing result of each uh, specimen yes i am used silver to okay i think all the questions i have answered if anything uh, is missed you can send me a mail i will try to give an answer
how long does Hi, sorry, Joji, can you hear me? Hi, yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, there is one more question by Arena. You okay. can have a look at that. Just a second. No, I think it's just a comment. It's not a. No, sir. Uh, here. Uh... It is just a comment. It's not a question. Oh, okay. Right. I was asking my question. Where are you sitting? You're sitting behind. Your background has got beautiful palm trees and beautiful colored sea. It is not Goa. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I am sitting in inside my room, and yes. the coconut tree and beach background is provided by Zoom, sir. Very good. That's lovely. It makes a nice background. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, guys. If there are no more questions, we are going to leave Joji in peace. Uh, thank you, Joji, once again. Ah, uh, sir. Actually, I have one correction. Please. Uh, do. Uh, this email I have uh, given for my sir. It is uh, Dinesh at nao dot org. Please kindly okay. correct. Okay, oh. Dinesh at nao dot org. I oh. will uh, put bo, uh, all mail ID in chat box. Sure. Yeah. Please do that. All right. So thank you again a lot, and uh, we'll stay in touch. I would love to know what results you will finally get from the samples that I had given. Okay, uh, to NIO. So please let me know in due course. When do you think you'll have the final results approximately? Uh, I think it, uh, I will discuss with Ms. Sarah and I will send you a message. Sir. Okay, lovely. Thank you good so time. much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And good night. Uh, and thank you for, to SSI for this platform, which is a wonderful platform to share all the stuff that we always needed to know, but we're afraid to ask. I think you've got two more questions. Somebody's still jumping in at the last minute. Oh. Uh, sir, mm -hmm. I... No, it's only thank you and good night. Yeah. Okay, wrong, wrong window, guys. It should be on the chat window. <laughs> okay. All right. And uh, thanks a lot to Karen as well, who has been helping me organize this stuff. And she's very much here with us. All right, folks. 99, we will post the recorded version of this very soon so that everybody who has not been able to come and uh, stay with us today will be able to get the benefit of this. Thank you. Good night. Good night. You. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.